15 minutes. Here we go. Uh, my son Andrew, he is a youth minister up in Lakeland, and I was telling him about this and, and uh, sharing with him that we uh, had, were doing 15-minute lessons. And he said, well, Dad, he said, that's the trend now among young preachers of 10 to 15 minutes. That's the new thing. But how are you going to do that? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not really sure, but we'll figure it out. Uh, one of the things my boys loved to do when they were younger is they loved to watch uh, martial art movies. And that was already referred to earlier, but they love these martial arts movies. And I tried to watch them with them, but you know, the plot lines are just too complicated. Um, the story trails are just too difficult on those things. Uh, pretty much all martial art movies kind of have the same storyline. You have one guy who has to beat up a whole bunch of other guys. And, and somehow, as was mentioned, the guys just keep coming and he just keeps beating them down. You know, it just keeps going. And, and I thought of that as I read the text uh, that, that I was given for this lesson. Because the world has a tendency to tell us that defending our ground is much like a martial arts movie. The world tells us that, you know, to defend our ground means that we stubbornly stand and we just beat everybody else down. Well, as I began looking at this account, I realized well, on the surface that's what it, it appears that happened with Shama. But there's actually much more to it than that. Let's start off this morning by looking in 2 Samuel 23, verses 11 and 12. Beginning in verse 11, it says, Next to him was Shammah, son of Agi, the Herorite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where, where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's tr troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field, he defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. Now, here we have David's mighty men, and among them we have this man by the name of Shammah. The Philistines had attacked the people of God, and everybody ran away except this one warrior. And he stood in the middle of a field of beans and defended his ground. Now, when I first looked at this, I, I, I thought, well, basically like a martial arts movie. All these guys are coming at him, and he's just beating them down. And wow, look at what Shama did. But was Shama really the one who won the victory? No. This is not about what Shama did. This is about what God did. Shama was just a vessel. He was just an instrument. And it wasn't Shammah beating down this army of Philistines. It was God doing it through this man. And, and as I look at that, I, I recognize that for us as, as Christian men, we are called to defend our ground, but not in the way that the world tells us to. The world sends all kinds of mixed messages about what it is to be a man. And what it is to defend our ground, to defend our families, to defend who we are. But there are three basic principles that I want to quickly look at, and it will be qu quickly this morning. Three basic principles of what it is for us to defend our ground, to stand in position as Christian men. The first thing that I think we have to recognize is that defending our ground for God requires that we be willing to get into the middle of conflict. You see, the world tells us, and we're kind of trained to, to flee from conflict as much as we possibly can. We don't want to be in conflict. But scriptures tell us that if we are truly the Christian man that we're called to be, what's going to happen? We're in direct conflict with the world automatically. It automatically happens. And we have to be willing to be in the middle of that conflict. Not that we ask for it, not that we invite it. But we have to be willing to defend our ground in the middle of conflict when it comes. I think of Stephen in Acts chapter 6. He was arrested and he was brought before the council. And, of course, a number of accusations had been made against him. And, and they asked him if these were, accusations were, were true. 
Stephen could have responded in several different ways. First of all, Stephen could have, have just denied everything. He could have said, oh, they're false accusations, and left it at that. Stephen could have said, yes, they're true. Or he could have done what most of us often attempt to do in situations like that, and is, that is he could have tried to defend himself. He could have said, oh, but, but you know, these guys, they're lying, and let me tell you the truth, and let me explain to you what the real situation is. Let, you know, sometimes we think if we just talk enough, we can talk our way through any situation. And, and, and he could have done that. But what did Stephen do? He preached. He preached. What had gotten him into this trouble to begin with? Preaching. So what does he do? He preaches some more. He, he stands in the middle of the conflict. Stephen knows what that's going to bring. Stephen knows what it's going to cause. But he defends his ground. And yes, it led to his physical life, to the ending of his physical life. But you know what? That wasn't the ground Stephen was defending. I think sometimes we get so focused on trying to protect ourselves physically that we forget what's really important. And that is standing our ground, defending our ground spiritually. Because folks, if we don't defend our ground spiritually, it doesn't matter if we're physically alive or not. We're lost either way. And, and so defending our ground means that we have to be willing to get into the middle of conflict when that's necessary, when that time comes. But, but secondly, defending our ground for God requires courage. But again, not the kind of courage that the world talks about. The world defines courage very differently than, than the way God defines courage. I want you to think through Scripture and, and think to yourself, who is the most courageous, courageous man or person in Scripture? I submit to you that there are a lot of courageous men and women, but Jesus Christ had more courage than any person who's ever walked the face of this earth. And let's look just briefly at, at his courage. Uh, Christ was arrested in Gethsemane, and his options were very similar to those of Stephen. He could have done the same types of things. He could have denied. He could have defended. But Jesus' actions are a great profile in courage because there's three things he did that I believe were extremely courageous. Number one, it takes courage to be silent. Again, sometimes we think that courage means that I stubbornly stand my ground. And I'm not going to be bent, and I'm not going to move, and I'm going to let you know exactly what I think. Sometimes it takes courage just to stand in silence. You know, Jesus was largely silent throughout the process that led to his death. He said a few things, but for the most part, he courageously stood in silence because he had a greater purpose. You know, we, we often reward people for going on attack. And we think that people, if, if, if somebody's coming after us, then we have to attack back. And when we often think that that's defending ourselves. But what do we do when we attack back or when we, quote, unquote, defend ourselves? Typically, it's something like, it's not the idea of saying, well, let me explain to you what the reality is. What do we do? We start, they call me a name. What do we do? We call them one back. If they make an accusation against me, I make an accusation against them. If they, if they level all kinds of things to me, I level all kinds of things at their feet. I, it's not defending myself. I'm on the attack. Jesus did not defend himself. He did not attack. He was silent. It, it also takes courage to be selfless. And that's exactly what Jesus did. You know, we tend to go into protection mode when in conflict. We want to protect ourselves or we want to protect our family. Jesus did nothing to protect himself. Instead, he expressed concern for his mother. He expressed concern for those who were taking his life. But he did nothing to protect himself. 
brothers, that takes courage to stand and not defend yourself, but selflessly put yourself there as a sacrifice. And it also takes courage to forgive your attackers. We often mistake standing our ground for being stubborn, and we stand our ground and say, I'm not going to bend, and I'm I am not going to forgive that person until they what? Until they come to me. Until they make it right. Aren't we thankful that Jesus Christ didn't have that attitude toward us? Jesus forgave those who attacked him. Jesus forgives us. That's a profile in courage. And, And defending your ground requires that you stand in courage. But then finally, I believe that defending your ground for God means that you never, ever stand still. You know, we think that defending our ground means that we stay in position. And and Shama did that. Shama stood in position and, and, and stood in the middle of that field. But standing for God requires that we're constantly moving forward. I think of the greatest example being the Apostle Paul. You know, once... Paul's sight was restored to him after uh, the road to Damascus. Uh, Paul started moving forward, and he never, ever looked back. And he never stopped. Now, Paul stood his ground, but he never stood still. He was constantly moving forward. He stood his ground for God. He defended the faith. He carried out his mission but he never stood still. And as Christian men, I think that's one of the greatest challenges that we have, is we get into this mode of of saying, okay, I'm here, I've got my family, I've got my home, I've got my life. It's all comfortable. It's all good. And so I can just kind of sit in position. I can stay right here spiritually, emotionally, and even physically in position right here, and I can defend my ground right here, everybody come to me. But you see, to truly defend our ground for God means that we're constantly moving forward. Not always necessarily moving physically. As as it was mentioned, I'm kind of covering the state. I just keep going further south. Um, I'm not sure what the next step is being in Homestead. Uh, You know, uh, Cuba is just right around the corner there. But... um, (laughs) And, and I, I have had a tendency to move a lot, but it's not about physically moving. It's about being on the move for God. Being spiritually strong enough to stand our ground, but not stand still. And I think the greatest passage, and we'll close with this this morning. I've got two minutes to get it out. The greatest passage that makes this point is written by the Apostle Paul in the his letter to the Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Passage we're all familiar with, Philippians 3, beginning of verse 12. Paul says, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus made it his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says here that standing our ground means that we never stand still. We just keep moving. We keep growing spiritually. We keep fostering that growth and that that relationship with God in our lives. And we keep moving I submit to you that if you are in the same place today spiritually that you were when you became a Christian, there is a problem. And you are not the man that God has called you to be. Because God has called you to defend your ground, but never stand still. Thank you.